So delighted to be here today. Thank you so much for a warm introduction and the great hospitality I've received so far from uh, my Penn State colleagues. Uh, I like to say that I'm a walking, talking oxymoron, uh, a humanist from MIT. And I think it's that, that mixture of doing cultural analysis at one of the world's leading technical institutions that leads to the kind of discussion we're going to have today. I approach the questions we're going to talk. I, I realize this conference is about technologies for teaching. And we're definitely going to talk about technologies all the way through this. But I'm also very interested in cultures for teaching. I'm also very interested. And our program starts from cultural and social questions about changes that are taking place in people's lives, especially as they engage with media, and use that as a starting point to reimagine the future of technology. That is, I, I may come from MIT, but uh, the technology is the smallest of the, you know, the, the, the last step in a process for us, not the first step. But it comes out of living in an environment where technology is ever present. Um, so I'm going to talk this morning about the work we're doing with the MacArthur Foundation. And it's a, there, I should say that it's, it's part of a larger vision the MacArthur Foundation has launched to think about children's learning in the 21st century. My colleagues out on the West Coast, Peter Lyman at uh, UC Berkeley and uh, Mimi Ito at University of Southern California, are doing some pretty in-depth ethnographies of how kids are using media right now, how they're learning through popular culture, uh, the informal communities that are growing up. Uh, we expect to be joined next year in this initiative by Howard Gardner at Harvard, who's going to be working with us on some of the dimensions of children's ethics as the, and how they acquire ethical standards in response to the new media environment. Uh, and to Jim G and his colleagues at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, who are going to help us think even more deeply than we have so far about games-based learning. And there's going to be a new book series that MacArthur is involved with of cutting edge scholarship on a number of questions involved with children and learning. So I'm, my task in this has been to think about the educational implications of this, to begin to develop a white paper that will come out this August that talks about how kids learn, what they're learning, and what the skills they need to acquire to deal with a shifting media landscape. And then we're beginning to build pedagogical tools uh, we're beginning to develop new, new uh, resources for teachers, new curriculum materials, new approaches to thinking about media education, and tools that we eventually envision rolling out across a range of existing school disciplines. I mean, we're working both in an after-school context and in a school-based context. Our focus is, prior to the kids you guys are working with, is we're working mostly with middle school and high school. But I think that the implications of what we've found here will have enormous ramifications for the ways we think about what takes place in the college classroom as well. Uh, come on, wake up. So I begin this with a quote from the New London Group, which is a group of language and literacy pedagogues who met in Australia and issued a manifesto about a decade ago about where literacy learning should be going. It's called a pedagogy of multiliteracy. And it's, they said if it were possible to define generally the mission of education, it could be said that its fundamental purpose is to ensure that all students benefit from learning in ways that allow them to participate fully in public, community, and economic life. We might add to that creative life, that, that is the world of the arts. And it's this question of participation that governs the work that we're doing on the MacArthur New Media Literacy Project. That is, we're interested in what kinds of changes have taken place in our culture which enable kids to become active participants in the production, circulation, and reception of media. How are we, how's that changing the way we think of ourselves? Early signs are that this new participatory culture is changing the way kids think about things like intellectual property, that kids respond differently to intellectual property if they produce media than if they simply consume it. We're seeing research of books like Got Game talk about new social skills in the workplace, new teamwork-based skills in the workplace that emerge from a culture of collaboration. My colleague Justin Cassell at Northwestern is telling us there's a new political style emerging, a we-based style as opposed to an I-based style that emerges as kids interact in this new environment. We're seeing reports that suggest new creativity and new forms of creativity emerging in this space. So we're interested in participation and the ways that the new media environment and facilitate those forms of participation. To, on to the, the other side of the screen there, I have this image from the Kaiser Foundation report on youth and their relationship 
to new media. Uh, and this has sort of shaped the way the dominant media discourse about this has gone. The, the Kaiser Foundation likes to talk about screen time. And they've created quite a lot of alarm about the amount of time kids spend looking at screens. Now, I, you know, I understand where that alarm's coming from, but I think it sort of co collapses together all the different things we do on screens into one sort of large category. It's not making very meaningful distinctions between different activities. It's a kind of discourse about what the media is doing to us, whereas I think what our discourse should be about is what we're doing with media. And I think that distinction is an important one to hold on to. Just by way of an aside, if you look at the chart there, this is the things people got very upset about. That they said that uh, the number, it's about the number of six-year-olds, kids under six, who spend more than two hours a day using screen media. And it says 83% of kids under six use, consume screen media more than two hours a day. But look, look underneath that. 83% of them also play outside more than two hours a day. And 79% are read to by their parents more than two hours a day. Now, the one number got blown out of proportion. You know, I'd like to understand, you know, to my mind, that looks like a pretty balanced media diet. There's a range, there are a range of activities going on in those kids' lives. Media is taking its shape alongside a variety of other activities. We want to think about, you know, if media was squeezing out the others, I'd be very concerned. If media is part of what it is to be a kid in American culture, I'm less concerned. The challenge, though, is not how many hours of media, but how are they using media during that time? What's their relationship to it? And what are we doing to give parents skills to think about how they prepare their kids to be creative and ethical users of media during those two hours plus a day that kids are involved in consuming media? The, the Kaiser Foundation report simply asked parents whether, what restrictions they placed on kids' media use. It doesn't ask parents to think about what, what role they play in instructing kids and in how to use media during that period. Let's begin with a couple of stories. First is the story of Ashley Richardson, 15-year-old girl. She runs for leadership of her community. She, if she wins that office, she is going to run a government of more than 200 employees. Uh, she has a debate on national public radio uh, over this. She ends up in an election dispute over a rigged election uh, and has to argue effectively for a reform of her community. All of this takes place in Alphaville, which is the largest town in The Sims Online. This is Heather Lawver. Heather Lawver, at 14, uh, becomes fascinated with how to foster literacy learning among her own generation. She's inspired by a book to create an online newspaper where kids around the world, 200 kids around the world, publish regular news stories uh, in collaboration with each other. The book in question, Harry Potter. This is Blake, oh, I should say about Heather as well, that when Warner Brothers goes after Harry Potter fans online, Heather becomes a national spokesman for a struggle between consumers and producers over intellectual property, ends up going on the O'Reilly uh, factor and debates uh, lawyers from the studio on national television. This is Blake Ross. At the age of nine, he starts playing Sim, the Sim, Sim City. By 14, he has an internship at Netscape. By 17, he's talking to venture capitalists. And by 19, he's launched Firefox, uh, a, a, a search engine that many of you probably have on your desktop today. This is Joshua Meter. Joshua Meter at 15 uh, is creating his first claymation animation, a film called uh, Award Showdown, in order to make this, which is about a battle between Lucas and Spielberg. Uh, in order to create it, he tracks down John Williams and acquires rights to his music. Then he tracks down Spielberg and gets it distributed through the official DreamWorks website. Now, these are exceptional individuals, right? These represent the skills that kids are going to be involved with as future educators, political leaders, businessmen, and artists, right? That they, there's remarkable skills involved there, and not just skills at making things, but skills at networking, at connecting with other people, at being part of the world. Now, at any given point in time, they're exceptional individuals. We concede that, right? That's, the fascinating thing is that most of these skills these kids acquire, they're acquiring outside of school, right? Not only do these kids do this through popular culture, through their outside of school hours. But in fact, in talking to these people, all of them had troubled relationship with schools. These were kids who didn't fit into, didn't perform well at schools. They didn't fit in with schools. Many of them are homeschoolers. That is, they're kids who broke out of the school processes that currently constituted to enter into a new kind of relationship to education. But again, we can dismiss this as exceptions. We can always find the exceptions. 
The interesting thing is to think about what's going on in the lives of average American teens. The Pew Center for Inter Interim and American Life did a study that was released last December, found that more than half of all American teens and about 57% of teens who use the internet could be considered media makers. And I think they actually have a fairly conservative definition of media making, because they don't, for example, include the construction of your own character and the performance of your character in a game space. They're merely talking about live journal, about blogging, about uh, digital cinema and digital photography. But there are all new, there are a variety of other forms beyond that. So I think, if anything, it's a conservative estimate. That 33% of these teens share what they create online with others. That 22% have their own home pages. That 19% blog, 19% remix content found online. These are some pretty amazing statistics about the level of participation. Now, it's also interesting to think then that there's 43% of teens who are not involved, who are online and not involved in these processes. So we often act as if it's every kid in America. It's not. And both of those sets of statistics are ones we want to think about, the 43% and the 57% as we look at this. Now, people have assumptions about who these kids are. So I'm normally said, told when I'm talking to this talk, well, you're really just talking about white suburban guys. But not true. It is, in fact, if you look at the Pew statistics, it shows the overwhelming number of people making media today are urban-based kids, 40% of urban kids uh, compared to 28% of suburban kids making media and 38% of rural kids. So in fact, it's all, the suburban kids are the least likely to be involved in these activities, at least according to the Pew study. Similarly, it's not necessarily guys. It is all, particularly among the older kids, 27% of older girls are, are produce blogs, whereas only 17% of older boys produce blogs. Now, I talked to the people at Pew. They didn't provide any studies about race. And they said that it was because they did not see any statistical differences of any significance between white, black, and other minority kids. That is, it's, that participation takes different forms in these different cultural communities, that different mo modes of participation, but that almost across the board, kids who are online are involved in making things and circulating them within their own communities. So what we're talking about, what, the four kids I began with are kind of exceptional versions. They've gone further down that path. They've achieved certain, certain accomplishments there. But the things that started them on that path are things that are shared by, by large numbers of kids in American society. What we're describing is the emergence of a participatory culture. And a participatory culture is one where there are low barriers to artistic expression and civic engagement, where there's strong support for creating and sharing what you create with others, where there's some kind of informal mentorship that emerges, where the better and more exper the more advanced kids, the more experienced kids teach younger kids how to make stuff because they want them to be new contributors to their community. Then members feel that their contributions matter. There's a recognition or reward for your contributions. And there's enough social connectivity between members that people care what someone else thinks about what they made. That's a kind of environment that's supportive of new styles of learning, new opportunities to create and process culture. Now, that can take a variety of forms. It can take new kinds of affiliations, whether it's Facebook or MySpace or the kinds of clans that exist in multiplayer games. It can take new forms of expression, such as modding games or creating skins or blogging or so forth, new ways of expressing yourself. New forms of circulations. How do we circulate media? The images here are podcast, sort of represents podcasting as a new way of circulating information in this environment. And it means new forms of problem solving or gaming. The images here are just celestial forms of collaboration that are emerging in this new kind of space. And I'll come back and talk about each of those in a little more details later. Now, we often act as if kids just acquire this on their own. And indeed, I'm pointing to the value of informal learning throughout this process. There's a lot of kids who are acquiring it on their own, but there's still reasons for adult intervention in that space. Oh, I skipped a slide here. So this, is, this just shows how central this is to the current debate, both these are two ma national news magazines a week apart. Time magazine talking, are kids too wired for their own good? They take the anti-position, focusing on multitasking as distraction, uh, as, wearing, as sort of wearing and stressing full of kids. The other one, putting the we in the web, talks about MySpace, Web 2.0, the new economic value being generated by this. It's part of a larger public debate that's emerging even as we speak about these forms of affiliation and participation. All right, so why do we need to intervene? Why not just let it go its own course? 
Well, there are a number of reasons. One, to start with, is to think about the 43% the, the I raised earlier, the kids who are not yet making media, and whether, what happens to those kids. A decade ago, we were talking about the digital divide. The digital divide was about technological access. We wanted to ensure that every kid in America had access to the internet. An important challenge, a worthy challenge. I don't want to say we've totally closed the digital divide, but we've gone an extremely long way toward it, to the point that, statistically speaking, almost every kid in America, outside of the Native American reservations and outside of certain rural pockets, has access to the internet through school libraries and public libraries, if not through their home. Right? That it's, that the, gap, the access problem is one we've may gone a long way towards solving. But the access problem reveals what's a new kind of problem, which is social and cultural. That is the difference between those kids who live in media-rich environments, who experience lots of media participation on an ongoing basis, who are literally connected 24-7, and those kids who have 10 minutes of access a day through, at best, through a school library where there's no storage capacity, no ability to upload, where everything is filtered, that level of experience is fundamentally different. And that affects our schools in multiple ways. It affects our schools because the most connected kids are being de-skilled when they enter the relatively technologically low zone of the school classroom. Their best ways of learning and knowing are taken away from them as they walk through the schoolhouse gates. The other side, though, is those kids who have none of that experience, no access to the hidden curriculum this new participatory culture represents, who enter the school behind or the ones who are shoved aside when kids sit down at the school computer. So we have to move from talking about the digital divide to talking about the participation gap. And this is Sonia Livingston, a British scholar, who said, no longer are children and young people only or even mainly divided by those with or without access. Though access is a moving target in terms of speed, location, quality, and support, and inequalities in access do persist. Increasingly, children and young people are divided into those for whom the Internet is an increasingly rich, diverse, engaging, and stimulating resource of growing importance in their lives, and those for whom it remains a narrow, unengaging, and if occasionally useful resource of rather less significance. That's what we're calling the participation gap. And we should be as concerned about access to experiences, skills, knowledge which emerge through participation as we were a decade ago about questions of technological access. It's a new challenge we face. Second reason we should be concerned is what we're calling the transparency problem. And this has cropped up as we begin working with games for learning and games for education. We discover kids are very good at using games to access, process, and work with new knowledge but they do not yet see the game itself as constructed. So we had a, we, one of my students worked on a game uh, set at Lexington, handheld game where kids were comparing different historical accounts of the first shot fired at Lexington and trying to figure out who did it. Uh, a very exciting game. It taught them a lot about history and how it's constructed from multiple points of view. The problem was that they didn't see the game as constructing the range of choices, of choosing voices and mobilizing it. They, they could think, they used media, they didn't think about media. It's like asking fish to think about uh, the water. It's part of their environment, but it's not something they consciously articulate. So we need to make that on a conscious level and think about the place of media in kids' lives. And third is the ethics problem. And the ethics problem has to do with how we socialize kids into new systems of ethics. And this is what Howard Gardner is helping us and so those kids are being thrown out there making decisions about commu as communicators with no ethical guidance, no instruction by adults. In fact, the adults don't understand the spaces and issues they're confronting. And that's something that should worry all of us, even those who believe, to as I do, in free expression, youth empowerment, and so forth. We've got to figure out a way to give them guidance as they enter into these new kinds of spaces. So here are the questions that motivate our work. How do we ensure that every child has access to the skills and experiences needed to become a full participant in the social, cultural, economic, and political future of our society? How do we ensure that every child has the ability to articulate their understanding of the way the media shapes our perceptions of the world around us? And how do we ensure that every child has been socialized into the emerging ethical standards which should shape their practices as media makers and as participants within online communities? Those are the challenges which teachers need to take on as we think about media education for the 21st century. Now, part of what we're, you know, part of the discourse of media and learning has been the discussion about complexity. In this book, I recommend, if you haven't read it, Stephen Johnson's book, Everything Bad is Good for You, sparked a debate last year about media and complexity. He's arguing, essentially, across the board, popular culture today is more complex, more demanding of kids 
and, and uh, on adults than media of a previous generation. That is, if you look at a show like Lost, it, you know, the number of characters, the number of story arcs, the amount of mystery and enigma that's involved with it, there's no question that it's more complex. But the same would be true if you looked like a show like Survivor or American Idol. There's a level of complexity. Take a look at Pokemon, right? Pokemon has a system that is as complex as the periodic table. 250 characters, multiple permutations of those characters in their life cycle, multiple sets of antagonisms and, and uh, friendships between those characters and each other. A very elaborate system that kids master. And no one says to a kid, you can't learn this. No one says, this is too difficult to you. That our schools are dumbing down the content at the same moment that popular culture is demanding more of kids than ever before. That we, we decide it's too much to teach kids the, all the Greek gods. Just choose a couple. That's OK. You know, whereas the kids are learning hundreds of characters in Pokemon at the same time. That our schools are getting out of whack with our popular culture. And it's not that popular culture is dumbing us down, which is the usual charge. Quite the opposite. Our schools are dumbing us down. And that what's left of intellectual challenge within our culture is through popular culture. Now, why are we able to do that? It's in part because we now work not as individuals, but as groups to solve these problems. As Pierre Levy talks about collective intelligence, the members of a thinking community. Basically, collective intelligence is a world where nobody knows everything, everybody knows something, and what's known by any member is accessible on a moment's notice by the group as a whole. If you think about an internet community in those terms, you have this rich knowledge culture that's based on a collaboration. It's based on shared knowledge. Um, we can contrast that, again, with the way schools think about learning. The autonomous learner. Kids learn, you know, any form of knowledge sharing in school is cheating, right? We've, we live in a world where the adult space is all about collaboration, and our schools are still teaching us as if we had to be these autonomous individuals who go in on our own, as if we're John Wayne out on the frontier. What we want to suggest is we think about literacy for the next decade. Next decades, we think of it as a, a social skill a cultural competency, not an individual skill and competency. It's something we learn together. And part of that skill is the ability to pool knowledge and compare information with other people. All right, let's think just quickly about what's going on in the media world around this that provides a context for this. The current media environment is, first of all, innovative. We're in a period of prolonged and profound technological change, during which new media are created, dispersed, adopted, adapted, and absorbed at dramatic rates. Secondly, it's transformative. It's a period of social and aesthetic experimentation as a society absorbs and often anticipates new media technologies. It's convergent that communication gets organized across multiple channels on both the corporate and grassroots level. And it's multimodal and the same story, the same information may be encountered in multiple representations at the same time. It's domesticated and the media technologies are fully integrated into our everyday lives. And it's mobile, and we carry information around with us everywhere we go. It's appropriative in that new technologies make it easier for us to archive, annotate, reappropriate, and recirculate media content. And it's participatory in that we're seeing a blurring of the line between consumer and producer, or we could say between teacher and student, as kids increase a, a flattening out effect, to use uh, the, the world is flat sort of analogy, flattening out effect of old hierarchies and the emergence of what people are calling ad hocracies. Uh, it's collaborative in that the emergence of new structures of knowledge and creativity depend, as I suggested, on shared problem solving and deliberation. It's networked in that we're connected. All the technologies are interconnected, so messages flow easily from one place to another, from one community to another. Which matters because media is now global. The media enables interactions between people around the world which is having both positive and negative effects on, our society, on local cultures. And it's diverse. The walls between cultural communities break down as media flows across various sites. It's generational and that there are sharp differences between generations in terms of access to knowledge, cultural taste, and interest, forms of participation and learning. That is, kids live in a different world than their parents. And it's unequal in that the access to technologies skills and opportunities for participation are unevenly distributed across the population. I think about that list and think two things. First of all, if you were designing an educational system for the world I just described, would it look at even at all like the educational system we currently have? Probably not. And the sec because the second point is that of all those traits, the only one that describes our schools as they exist today is that they're unequal. All of the others 
describe a reality that is totally beyond the way we've conceptualized our schools. That our schools do a lousy job across all of those axes in preparing kids for the world. That we're preparing kids for the world that was, not the world that will be. Or even the world they're living in right now. That it, the schools are locked into old notions of literacy, which are not getting us ready to think about the coming changes the millennial generation and beyond are facing. So what do kids need to know? I mean, first of all, I have to say, people say, imagine when we talk about media literacy, we're pitting against traditional literacy. You cannot participate in this culture if you can't read and write well. Traditional literacy still matters. It's absolutely central to what we're doing. It is the foundation. Similarly, the traditional research skills that librarians have long fostered, weighing sources, collecting evidence, you know, uh, documenting where your sources come from, matter more now than they ever did before. A core foundation of technical skills are still absolutely central to kids' ability to participate. And media literacy, as it's been taught in the United States over the last couple of decades, that is reading representations, understanding codes, conventions, language, absolutely essential. These are essential but not sufficient for thinking about the coming decades. What I want to focus on is not just miss any of that, but focus on what are the skills we need now to prepare for the future that we're not doing, that are in addition to this. And I'm not saying we've done a very good job with those first four. We, we've got a lot of work to do in all of those areas if we're going to get, ready, get kids ready for the world they're moving into. But I want to talk about beyond that what we need to be doing. First of all, I'm going to argue that play itself is a basic skill. It's the capacity to experiment with your surroundings as a form of problem solving. That as kids are, and it's not just the motivational aspects of games. People talk about the fact that kids will stay up late to solve a level in, in a game and go to bed early solving a difficult homework problem. That the worst thing you can say about a bad game is that it's too easy, and the worst thing you can say about a bad assignment is it's too hard. There's a gap in the complexity your kids are willing to process. But there's a way of learning that is based on experimentation. You, you try something, you die, you start over. The risk or love, right? Compared to, oops, there went your grade for the term. You know, that, that, that sort of attitude of let's try things out. And built into the game is something like the scientific method. I begin with an assumption about the property of this is world. I try something on the assumption that properties are there. That is, I'm testing my hypothesis. If it doesn't work, I refine my hypothesis. I come away with a more complex picture of the world. And I'm able to do this over and over again until I develop an understanding of the game I'm involved with. And I can do that increasingly with real world variables. So that if we look, now I, let's leave Grand Theft Auto out of it. Let's look at Civilization. Let's look at The Sims. Look at SimCity, Age of Empires, Railroad Tycoon. Countless games that are commercially successful involve real world data sets, complex variables, and the ability to work through them. And so that, that mode of thinking that games foster is an important set of skills that schools need to recognize. It's tied very closely with the idea of simulation. That is, how do we process dynamic models of the real world. And this is something fundamental to the way modern science is conducted, for example. How do scientists make sense? How do social scientists make predictive models and process the world? The ability to understand what a simulation is, to construct one, to use one, the processual, processual models of the world are very central to entering almost any profession that you're entering today. And it's tied directly to this notion of understanding how games operate. Performance, that is the ability to adopt alternative identities for the purpose of improvisation and discovery. Another important skill, and one that we see in kids' everyday recreational life, dressing up. That is work on early literacy suggests kids learn how to read books by play acting, by quoting, by dressing up, by retelling the stories among themselves. That mode of play is a very powerful mode of learning. If we think about how an actor acquires a role, they take knowledge from multiple places synthesize it together, construct a character, and act on that character on the stage. This turns out to be the way scientists, researchers are finding, think through problems. They, they say, I'm the molecule, and I'm circulating around, you know, that they, they discuss things in gestural ways that grow out of assuming different roles in relation to the knowledge. And it's also the way designers say are thinking today, that you create, you create sort of profiles of imaginary users of your project, you imagine future scenarios, of you, she works through them. And so this role play carries important functions for skills in the adult world. Appropriation, the ability to meaningfully sample and remix media culture. We mostly right now read this through a piracy frame. But go back in time. Which of the works of the Western canon were not themselves works of appropriation? Isn't the Sistine Chapel a great work of sampling the biblical tradition? 
Wasn't Melville the great remixer of the 19th century? Didn't uh, Shakespeare steal his, his plots outright from other characters? We falsify creativity by focusing on autonomous creativity rather than understanding the relationship of the artists to their culture. And what we need to do if we're going to deal with kids in a Napster age is to have them think through the ethics, the politics, and the poetics of appropriated media. Rather than pretending that the past was all about original creation and the present is somehow de debased because kids are creating stories based on existing media properties or whatever. We need to actually think through that in a more complex way. All right, contrary to Time Magazine, I think multitasking is not, uh, is not a defi learning deficiency, it's a skill. It is the ability to process information, to make quick decisions based on imp imperfect bits data sets, but in order to make reasonable predictions about what matters and what doesn't matter in a complex visual and information environment is a skill. That people make a distinction between what farmers learned and what hunters learned. That farmers needed to look at one thing closely over a long period of time, and hunters needed to scan a complex environment. Our current schools were built for farmers. We now need to build a schools that also train hunters. And I say also train hunters because I'm not suggesting we get rid of traditional literacy and focus and attention. You know, the problem is not that kids multitask. The problem is they multitask all the time. The problem is not a short attention span. It is that we, we need to teach multiple ways of dealing with the world and multiple ways of processing information. All right, distributed cognition is another skill we identify, which is the ability to interact meaningful with tools and information appliances in relation to your real world spaces. So the use of the handheld, the mobile technologies as information appliances, we read in relation to real world physical spaces. And we've been involved with augmented reality games that use GPS enabled di fictional data in response to real world environments. So there's a game called Environmental Detectives. You play on the MIT campus, the scenario is chemical leak toward the Charles. You've got to figure out how, where it's coming from and how to mediate it. You walk through campus physically, you look at when you're in that location, you can access fictional data about the chemical saturation of the soil there. And you read it in relation to the slope of the land, erosion patterns, and proximity to the river. That is, you're reading fictional data in relation to the real world. It's that movement between information appliances and direct observation that becomes a very important set of skills. I talked earlier about collective intelligence, the ability to pool knowledge and compare notes with others toward a common goal. And that's what kids are acquiring through games like I Love Bees, which is a game that half a million people play uh, last year in anticipation of the release of Halo 2. Typical problem in this game, you've got a string of numbers and you're trying to figure out what those numbers mean. Turns out the numbers are GPS location. It turns out they're GPS locations of payphones in all 50 states. You discover that you have to get someone to each of those payphones at a specific moment in time. The phone will ring, a real person will pick up the line, they'll, tell, they'll ask you a question about data that's buried somewhere in about 50 web pages. You've got a minute and a half to answer the question. You can't play that game alone, let's put it that way, right? It's all about networking. It's all about forming teams that are large scale. Who do you know who lives in Montana who can get to this location at this particular point in time? It's designed to foster, consciously designed to foster what we're calling collective intelligence and new kinds of problem skills that half a million people were involved playing this game is a phenomenon of this new internet environment. All right, judgment. This is an old skill, but one I think takes on new importance, the ability to evaluate the reliability and credibility of different information sources. Now, up on the screen there is Survivor, and that's sort of cryptic, unlike some of the other images. Survivor is there because of spoiling. Spoiling is something that the Survivor fan community is involved in, by which they mean tracking down information about what's going to take place on reality television before it reaches the air. So these people are involved in figuring out who all the contestants are before they're announced by the network. And they do it by surfing the information environment. So some, you, know, you, you get a report that someone showed up from work having been gone for two months, came back 30 pounds lighter, covered with leech marks and bad sunburn, uh, and they won't tell anyone where they've been. Maybe they were on Survivor. You can't take these average people out of their lives for that much time and then dump them back in without leaving traces. So those traces emerge in the internet environment. Kids, kids track down that information. They sort it out, what's reliable, what's not, and solve these problems. And they use satellite photographs from space to figure out where the base camp was. Right? And when look at what buildings are there, what the physical signs of the contest were. And now increasingly they're sending reporters from their own community to the location, they interview maids, 
and track down information about who arrived back at the loser hotel first to try to solve this problem. But it involves massive amount of data collection and data processing and collaborative processing and weighing of information in order to play that game. And they're incredibly successful at it. All right, transmedia navigation, the ability to deal with the flow of stories and information across multiple modalities. And here I'm referring to the work of Gunther Kress, who's written a lot about multimodality. That is the ability to see the same piece of information in multiple forms, to recognize the connections from it, and to learn something new from each of those manifestations of it. And this is kids learn this playing Yu-Gi-Oh! and Pokemon, right? That is, the characters exist in different forms across <coughs> different books. How do we understand the relationship to those bits of information? Networking, the ability to search for, synthesize, and disseminate information. Two, two examples of that. One's the legendary KO. This is a group in Houston, a hip-hop group. No one had ever heard of them before. They did a song called George Bush Doesn't Care About Black People after Katrina. Within two weeks' time, it went platinum. That is, more than a million people downloaded this song for free. It became a global phenomenon purely off of networking. No record label behind it, nothing. Just purely a network-based phenomenon. The other one, this other image there is a reenactment of the Matrix Reloaded that took place at the Shibula Station in Tokyo. Right? The smart mob, basically sent out by SMS and by the internet, come up this time dressed up like Agent Smith. We're going to do the scene from Matrix Reloaded. And they took pictures using cameras, cell phone cameras. They uploaded it to Flickr and it, hit the, and it became part of the world discussion around this film. So those are networking skills. Skills at connecting with other people that seem fairly important. Negotiation is the ability to travel across diverse communities, discerning and respecting multiple perspectives and grasping and following alternative sets of norms. How do we live in multiple spaces online and how do we connect with people around the world who are different from us and understand what's at stake for them in their lives? That's a skill we desperately need to foster and it may be the worst skill of all of these in terms of our culture's acquisition of it. But I'm interested in Things like the Center for Deliberative Democracy, which has taught people how to deliberate together about information about politics and to begin to acquire shared beliefs, shared attitudes. Something we desperately need to do if we're going to move from a red America and a blue America to a purple America again. So how do we foster those? I'm, I'm, I'm running a little long, so I'm going to get to the last bit here quickly. We're trying to develop a pedagogical system that systematically looks at those skills in relation to the broadest possible range of academic subjects. That all of those skills are things that can be used in any discipline. The very, some disciplines depend on some more than others, but they're all things that each discipline. We're not talking about media literacy as a standalone subject, right? An added thing on the day. It's got to be a paradigm shift. It's got to be a change in the way we think about how we teach everything. It's got to, and that's why it's so important to talk to a group like you who come from so many different disciplines. We've got to actually build those skills in the way we think about every subject in the schoolroom if we're going to have to be successful at closing that participation gap. Now we're developing a kind of approach to media education, mostly for the after school space, which tries to couple the production orientation of the computer clubhouse movement with a critical perspective of media literacy. And it's based on a four part process. Exercises, which rehearse and refine preliminary skills. Exemplars, which help you look at closely at existing examples of practices. Expressions, which allow you to put their skills to use by making and sharing media and ethics, which requires you to reflect on the choices you've made in that production process. And that's built into the, the materials we're going to be developing over the next few years. And we're going to be doing stuff around maps in social science, around visualization in science, around Melville as a master remixer for literature teaching. We're trying to take stuff that's over the plate, that is stuff schools need to be teaching now within specific disciplines, and show how you can couple those techniques and how you can couple these skills to, to change the way we think, teach and think about those subjects. And so that's the work I'm going to be doing. We've got a work cut out for us, but I'm hoping that that's a project that's not, that's bigger than MIT, that as you think about your own work, maybe this framework helps you think in some new ways about what it is to teach kids of the current generation. So I'm going to end there. Thank you. It's uh, great to know what's going on in the minds and hearts and spirits of uh, students considerably younger than we are. And I hope that all of us are well rested as we think about the years ahead. There's only two of us, Rob, did you say in August? 
Yeah, I think so. Uh, we have time uh, for a uh, couple of questions, and then Brett Fixler will want to talk a little bit about the logistics. Questions for him? Great. Yes. Well, you know, that's the interesting thing. Um, we, you know, when we say play, we assume fun. And what, I, what I've suggested is we should talk instead about engagement, right? Because when I work, I'm deeply engaged. You know, it's what, when I'm involved in something in my profession that I care about, there's a level of engagement which will keep me working very, very long. Now, we tend in our culture, because we're a Puritan society, to separate out work from play because we're separating out you know, door, tedium, dullness, you know, plodding along from, from fun. And I think we've got to reconfigure that as we think about it. We, the interesting thing is when you look at gamers, they're actually spending a great deal of time grinding, as they'd say, doing stuff that isn't very much fun at the time that contributes toward a large long-term goal. So if you're playing a multiplayer game, you spend a lot of hours just grinding away to get the skills that you need in order to open up the door or reach the level of accomplishment you're at. It's not antithetical to work at all. It's just that work is motivated in a different way, that they, our, relation, our emotional relationship to that work is different from our puritanical notion of work. You know, and we, don't, we ask our students to do stuff we wouldn't do, that is keep working when it's tedious and boring with no intrinsic motivation whatsoever other than a grade. Is that's not what motivates us at work, is that letter grade. Our boss gives us at the end of every day, I, I guess I always skip out before the day's over, never get the letter grade, right? We do it because we want to do a good job and we want to advance on a certain level and so forth. So the challenge is to give kids a sense of why they're learning the knowledge they're doing. When we think about educational games, the first thing we ask an instructor is, what's the knowledge allow you to do? Because knowledge in games is knowledge put to use. It's not knowledge that's inert in a textbook. And, in order to, and, and games, therefore, may be better than our current teaching practices at helping us to see knowledge is something I acquire because it's useful and because I can do things with it. This is uh, my colleague David Schaefer, UW-Madison, talks about epistemic games. It is games that teach us the epistemology of a particular profession, a way of thinking of the world, a way of doing things in the world, that may be better than teaching knowledge in the abstract in a textbook. So it may not be about work versus play, but it may be about motivation. It may be how we define work, how we think about engagement, how we think about the usefulness and the knowledge we're involved with. And if we're asking kids to acquire knowledge which we haven't given them any purpose for, that there's no real reward for, that doesn't have any touch, doesn't touch their own lives, then that's a the kind of work that hopefully, you know, most of us aren't really doing in our everyday lives. I mean, I know people work for, work for a buck, but I think there's, even there, they're working for their family, they're working for, you know, things that are bigger than what we're asking kids to work toward in most of our classes right now. So games can teach us a lot about that question. You said that virtual world is so engaging, so <coughs> is there a long-term danger that students will prefer them to the real world, that they'll get jobs just so they can go home and play their games in the evening, and the awards come from the virtual world rather than the real world? I, th I, mean, it, I think there's some risk of that. I think the challenge is to make these real worlds. You know, they're engaging with real people. They're involved in real collaboration. There's real knowledge sharing taking place. How do we get so that we build on those skills in, in the real world? I mean, I look at it and I think about the number of kids for whom the internet is more engaging than school. Maybe it should, instead of condemning the internet, we should ask what's going on in schools that disengages kids. You know, that why is this, the world online a more supportive social community? for kids who are different than, than are the hallways of the average American high school? And why are, you know, why are kids more engaged working together online than working alone in the classroom? So I was interviewed by the Harvard Business School, and they said, should, kids, should, parent, should employees of the future look for gamers? And I said, more than that, they should look, at, for, look for teams of gamers, people who already combine skills in interesting ways, whose minds already work well against each other, and hire a whole team to work together, because the, the collaborative context of the game fosters something else. Our, our workplaces already encourage, say, softball leagues because there's some value in playing together. Why don't they, why don't they encourage quake brigades uh, or World of Warcraft uh, clans? 
as a way of fostering community and acquiring skills that allow people to work together as units. So I think it's a challenge is to take what we can learn from those virtual environments, bring them back to the real world, and make the real world more like those things that people find engaging and meaningful there, rather than criticizing those places as too attractive and sort of luring us away. Great. Thanks. Henry will be here all day. I know that you'll want to talk to him personally. Brad, I know that you have to announce. Thank you. Thank you.